are going this way with the Nile and the Danube. The Danube was thought to flow into the Nile. Now, what the sources of those rivers were, uh, I presume they were assumed to be coming out of Eden, uh, the Tigris and Euphrates. But you can't, you can't get into the Christian universe and sort of, you know, they were looking for symbolic images, not necessarily scientific ones. It was the symbolism of the cosmology that they were after rather than the scientific text. But Dante's image is quite different from the popular image at that time. It's, it, the earth is round. And um, so when uh, uh, Columbus is sailing and he discovers the islands of the Caribbean, which he thinks must be the East Indies. That's why the Native Americans are called Indians. They were, the, uh, they were thought to be simply the uh, East Indians. And um, when he, on his return journey, actually, as he's, the ships, he noticed sailed faster, moving from south to north as he headed back to Europe. The currents moved faster, and he thought that must be evidence uh, that the waters of Eden were flowing from south to north and carrying his ships back. So he died with this Christian cosmology in his head, thinking that he had discovered the East Indies, and Japan would lie somewhere just around the corner. And as soon as, um, almost immediately, Amerigo Vespucci then comes in, after whom America is named, and discovers South America. So he actually discovers the continent. And then from that point on, you know, it's just one discovery after the next to the point where Magellan then circumnavigates the entire globe in 1521, thereby empirically proving that the Earth is round. It's known for an empirical, actual fact. It's been experienced, not just in theory. So that's the Columbian Revolution. All the maps as a result of what Columbus did had to be redrawn, the earthly maps. So the, the great scientific revolutions begin on the Earth with a redrawing of the maps. In the next uh, sort of scientific revolution, now, with respect to the mythologies of the West, we have the biblical mythology, which is the mainstream, and we have the mythology that I'm talking about with the anima mundi, which was regarded always as esoteric. It was really the initiated who knew about it, the intellectuals of the culture who knew about it. But both of them, and they're antipathetic visions. They're both mythologies, but both of them are being destroyed here by these revolutions, both the mainstream vision and the esoteric vision of the anima mundi. Um, <clears throat> so we have the Colombian, then uh, Copernicus, is an interesting character. He comes in in 1543 and publishes his work on his deathbed. Copernicus was your classic coward. Perhaps no bigger coward has existed in the history of thought than Copernicus. And this is funny because he is regarded as a great scientific revolutionary, and he was anything but. In fact, Copernicus was an intensely pious, intensely Catholic, conservative man who had set out on this supposed revolution. It wasn't a revolution at all, but the texts of Plato had been discovered in the Renaissance, and he was a Platonist, and he was obsessed with geometry, and he was particularly obsessed with making the motions of the planets come to perfect circles. The motion of the planets had gotten all confused because nobody could get it to work out right, and basically what you have is this kind of, um, and the planets would move on these further eccentrics and deference and all this artificial, this is what um, Arthur Kessler calls the Ferris wheel of the universe, and um, Copernicus didn't like this because it was sloppy, and it, did, it wasn't platonic. Plato said this, the circle is the perfect form, and if the heavens are the realm of perfection after all, then the planets must move in perfect circles. Well, how could you do that? Well, according to Copernicus, if you situate everything around the center of the sun, and he didn't originate that idea, the idea of the heliocentric cosmology was put forth by the Greeks, Aristarchus in particular, and he was a translator of Greek texts, and he would have come across Aristarchus' uh, discarded hypothesis of the heliocentric system, and he began to think, well, now if you situate everything around the sun rather than the earth, then you can make the planets move in perfect circles. So he's actually an intense conservative. He's going back to uh, the platonic world, not going forward into some new scientific universe. And it's funny because his best friends were all in the church. He himself was in the church, and they were all on his side. They liked the heliocentric vision of the cosmology. Um, in fact, the Copernican vision was taught in the Vatican by priests in the Vatican. And they were very enthusiastic about it because during the 16th century, the church was trying to reform the calendar. This was the period of the Gregorian calendar reform, and they couldn't get the calendar worked out right. There was a slippage where, uh, uh, like for example, uh, and all of this centered around Easter, getting the date for Easter to work out. There had been a slippage because Julius Caesar, when he had taken over the calendar from the Egyptians, which was a helios, kind of a sun-based calendar rather than lunar, um, estimated the length of the year is 365 and a quarter days. Well, it's not actually 365 and a quarter. It's, somewhat, it's five hours, 48 minutes, and 46 seconds short of a quarter. 
And that slippage of five hours, 48 minutes, and 46 seconds over the years gradually began to shift the vernal equinox to like March 11th in the 16th century. And the church was anxious about that because the date of Easter was supposed to be after Passover, after the first full moon that occurred after Passover on a Sunday. And it had to come out that way. So they were interested in Copernicus. They were giving him an audience. They, they wanted to know uh, if centering everything around the sun would make the Gregorian calendar come out right, then he would be a great star. But Copernicus was a coward. And even the, though the church kept encouraging him to publish his book, he wouldn't do it. He worked on it in private. And uh, he sort of circulated a little Cliff's Notes version of it amongst his friends. And they enjoyed that, and that's how his reputation began to spread. And it began to leak into the Protestant world. The Protestant outbreak is 1517, and here we're down into the like 1520s, 30s. And this Protestant man, uh, I think it's Redicus, comes journeying, and he really likes Copernicus, and he comes and he does all the scribe work for Copernicus, and uh, wants to get him to publish a version of it. And by the time Copernicus actually does publish the book, he doesn't mention a word about Redicus. And so uh, he was very ungrateful to this uh, man. It was really the Protestants who had a problem with the Copernicus, the Copernican Revolution, because the Protestants have now gone back to the Bible, and they are getting very literalistic about what the text says, who cares about the rituals, the Latin Mass, all of that. The Protestants were actually falling behind the times. The Catholics were momentarily ahead, only momentarily. But as a result of the increasing series of Protestant conversions amongst northern countries, the Counter-Reformation slowly began to come in, and the church lost tolerance for the Copernican vision and began to persecute first Giordano Bruno, whom they burnt at the stake in 1600, uh, made to make an example of him, and then threatened to burn Galileo. So the, the zeitgeist had shifted by the time you get to 1600 um, in Galileo. There's a whole new attitude that's coming. So Copernicus, on his deathbed, then uh, publishes his work, and it begins slowly to spread and, and leak out into, uh, eventually it arrives in Britain. Yes? So why was he so scared if the zeitgeist hadn't changed by it yet? He was afraid everybody would just make fun of him. Okay. All the scholars in the universities would laugh at him and ridicule him. It wasn't even a dangerous thing. <coughs> yeah. No. Oh, my love. Okay. <coughs> you find all this, by the way, in <coughs> uh, The Sleepwalkers by Arthur Kessler. It tells this whole story. <coughs> okay, so um, that's the Copernican Revolution. And a, a further point must be remarked on Copernicus that um, his uh, recentering of everything around the sun was based on no new data. No astronomical observations were made. Copernicus was a mathematician, but he wasn't an astronomer. He didn't really watch the heavens. There was no new data coming in at all. So the scientific revolution begins with an intellectual shift, purely based on theory. No data here. The great astronomical observations don't come in until Tycho de Bray, the Danish astronomer, and he was a very rich man and set up a, sort of built a castle that was devoted to astronomy and spent all this money on studying the stars. And the first real anomalous astronomical knowledge then begins to come in toward the end of the 16th century as Bray begins to, first he notices in 1572, the birth of a star, a supernova. He records it and then begins, well, if you have a star that's born, the sphere of the fixed stars can't be unchanging, can they? Stars can apparently come into being and go out. So he began to suspect that something was wrong. Although Bray rejected the Copernican vision and did a sort of modified version of it where most of the planets whirl around the Earth, but a couple of them, I think, uh, Venus and Mercury go around the Sun. Uh, that was his sort of, he was a very bad theoretician. And uh, the story is hilariously told of his relationship with Kepler, and Kepler is a real star of the show. As we move into the sort of, uh, you may as well say the third revolution here is the Newtonian. All of these men are the stars of the Newtonian revolution. and the date is right about 1600. Of the young Kepler, who is the sort of star of the show because he is the man here who has his foot in both worlds. Kepler was an astrologer. He was also a mathematician. He was also an astronomer. So he has uh, the theoretical abilities of Copernicus and the empirical astronomical observational abilities of uh, Tycho Brahe. So he is invited eventually by Tycho Brahe to come live with him. And Kepler is about 30. He's on his Saturn return. And uh, Tycho Bray is on his Saturn return because he's 60. And the two men, uh, he shows up and he lives there at the castle for a while. And they have this love-hate relationship with each other where Tycho Bray is absorbing all this data, but he won't show it. 